when one's looking at the issue of conflict of laws between the secular law and the Sharia, I mean, the starting point is you've got a transaction that's going on and you've got agreements and structures to sort out. So, first of all, you'll have to deal with the Sharia advisors. And if you're dealing with an Islamic finance institution, they'll be sitting on a Sharia supervisory board. So you'll go to them with your structure, your diagram, and your uh, draft documents. And there'll be a process. And that process, if it goes well, will result in you receiving a fatwa, which is an opinion from the Sharia scholars or the Sharia board saying that uh, the structure and the documents are uh, in accordance with the Sharia. Now, when you're actually drafting the documents, there'll be a clause saying what is the governing law. And that clause will say it's subject to the laws of Dubai or subject to the laws of uh, England or whatever. Now, there's a, obviously potential conflict here between a secular law and the fact that the Sharia advisors have said that the documents are in accordance with the Sharia. Interestingly, some Sharia boards are now actually saying that the standard type of clause that you get, which says this agreement is subject to the laws of England, has to have some extra wording, such as, provided it does not conflict with the Sharia. And some Sharia boards also say um, the definition or view of what the Sharia is will be decided by the Sharia board if there's ever a dispute. It'll be interesting to see if that particular provision has ever uh, comes before a court, whether a court would uphold that provision. Now, what happens if there's a dispute? There's two possibilities. It could go before the courts or it could go to arbitration. Now, the, the problem that one faces is that um, in many agreements you will see that the agreements are subject to the laws of England or New York. Um, or you know, they may well be subject to laws of, say, Malaysia or a country in the Middle East. But many countries, um, particularly in the West, but not exclusively so, um, have a situation where their laws have not been drafted to take into account the issues and the problems that you face with Islamic financing. So, you have um, an, an agreement subject to the laws of England, and let's say you go to the courts, um, how will those secular courts uh, deal with an Islamic financing document uh, in the context of the Sharia? Well, there's been a couple of cases in the UK uh, which have shed some light uh, as to how the secular courts will deal with this issue. Now, there are two cases in England uh, that have shed some light. Uh, one is a case called Symphony Gems, and that was a case dealing with a Murabaha ag agreement. Now that agreement said it was subject to the laws of England, no reference at all to the Sharia. Um, there was an attempt in the arguments put before the English court to say that those agreements were void under the Sharia. But here the English court said, as far as we're concerned, uh, our responsibility is merely to interpret these agreements in accordance with English law and that's the way that they uh, ruled. The other case um, was involved a Bahraini bank, Sharmal Bank, against uh, Beximco. That also involved Marabaha, but also Ijara. Now here, interestingly, the governing law provision said it's subject to the laws of England, uh, but subject to the principles of the Sharia. So the court had an issue here. Did it have to decide the agreement in accordance with English law or to take into account the principles of the Sharia? One of the problems that it faced was that the plaintiffs had their experts and the defendants had theirs. And they both gave different interpretations as to what the Sharia meant on particular issues. The court, in the end, decided it would not look at the Sharia, but it did say that if it had come to that conclusion, it would have a problem because of the different uh, views given to it by the experts. In any event, what the court decided was that it agreed with the trial judge, this was a court of appeal case, 
um, where the trial judge said that the reference to the Sharia was really a reference to the religious principles that the bank had to follow in its business. But the court in the end decided that as far as, as it was concerned, um, the Sharia was not a national law of a country. And as such, it, it uh, was not obliged and in fact could not follow and uh, the Sharia in the interpretation of the agreement. So here the court decided that it would interpret the agreement in accordance with English law, even though you know, there was a fatwa issued by the Sharia Supervisory Board in connection with uh, these uh, Islamic financing documents. Now, there have also been cases um, outside of Europe, um, even in the Middle East. For example, there was a Federal Supreme Court case in Abu Dhabi a few years ago um, that involved an Islamic financing uh, that came to it for a decision. It involved a masharika, a type of partnership or joint venture. Um, at the end of the day, what the court said was that they didn't actually view this as being a proper joint venture arrangement. They interpreted it in accordance with uh, local law, and their view was that this agreement was actually a financing agreement, and the bank was entitled to be repaid. And there's also been decisions in Malaysia uh, which, is up, which have upheld Islamic financing documents. So here you can see that the, the way that the courts would interpret an agreement, an Islamic financing document, where there's a governing law provision uh, which may make a reference to the Sharia or may not, um, is going to be uh, quite difficult to predict. Uh, but the fact of the matter is many countries uh, do not have laws in place that really regulate the Islamic financing techniques that you'll have. Um, I've sometimes been asked, well, if a secular court gives a judgment uh, that um, in effect ignores the Sharia principles, does that affect the fatwa? And in you know, my view it doesn't, and talking to the Sharia scholars, I think that's correct. Their view is, it's their opinion on the Sharia, and as far as they're concerned, if a, sh a secular court uh, disagrees with their opinion, it has no impact at all on their fatwa. Now, the, the, f the other um, way in which a dispute can be resolved is through arbitration. There's been an interesting decision in 2007 in England, um, which um, dealt with uh, a private um, family dispute uh, over land in, in London. Now, it doesn't directly impact on Islamic financing as such, but the principles are probably of interest to some Islamic financial institutions. The family um, decided that their dispute would go to arbitration and that the arbitrator would decide the dispute in accordance with uh, Shia law. Um, the arbitrator met uh, the parties, issued the award, and of course the, the, the party that lost uh, went to court uh, to say that um, the award was invalid. Now, the court here uh, drew a distinction between the arbitration agreement and the manner in which the arbitrator had to resolve the dispute. The court said, okay, this is an agreement, it's subject to English law, um, we will only interpret this agreement in accordance with English law uh, and not the Sharia because following the, that earlier decision, the Shamal Bank case, uh, Sharia is not a national law. However, uh, what they then said was that under the uh, English Arbitration Act, um, it is possible for the parties to instruct the arbitrator to decide the dispute in accordance with something that is not a national law. It could be um, mercantile law uh, or general principles of commercial law, or the court said you could actually say the arbitrator will decide the dispute in accordance with the Sharia. So this decision uh, is uh, interesting in that for an Islamic financial institution that uh, has to have, for whatever reason, an agreement subject to the laws of England, uh, but still wants a dispute resolved in accordance with the Sharia. It could structure the documents so that you still have the laws of England being the governing law, 
but disputes go to arbitration and the arbitrator is to resolve the dispute in accordance with the Sharia. So I think in summary, in the context of the tension or conflict between secular laws and the Sharia, um, you have to really look on a country by country basis to uh, see what the situation is and this is where the lawyer is going to have to come in and give you guidance.